The first scripture reading, please read with me in unison. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Alexa and Eliana, and Teresa and Jeremiah, how's everybody? Oh, hello, Scarlet and Violet. I had a little uh, stomach bug the other day, so I'm being cautious, and that's why I'm gonna wear the mask with you all, because I don't want you to get it, okay? So did you just listen to that story that we just read? Um, there's these two people, Adam and Eve, in a garden, and God says you can eat anything but the fruit off that one tree. And it, by the way, it didn't say apple, it just said fruit. We, all, we tend to think of it as an apple, but it's, it just says fruit. could have been a pomegranate, could have been anything. And what did they do? They ate it. Because they wanted to what? Be, to Say that again. Be like God? Yep. All right, I have another story, a similar story. My grandma used to tell me about my Uncle Keith. She said that one time they was in the summer and they were outside, and it was really hot, and he was playing in the sprinkler. And she had to go in the house... And she told him, very seriously, she said, I need to go in the house, and I'm going to leave you here by yourself. Don't you dare even put a toe on that road. Do you understand? And he said, yep. And then she went into the house, and she stood in the kitchen, and she looked out the window, and what do you think she saw? <laughs> he ran to the road and put one toe on it and back. Why do you think he did that? Because he, he didn't think she was going to see. Yep. But why would he do it? He wanted to be sneaky. He wanted to see what would happen. Huh, all good things. Anybody else? He didn't want to listen. Yep. I happen to be, because I'm the youngest in my family, I'm the youngest child, the youngest cousin on both sides. Um, so when you're the youngest, um, a lot of people tell you what to do when you're growing up. So you grow up with a little bit of, who are you to tell me what to do attitude, right? <laughs> Any of the youngest around? Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. It's fun in my house because my husband was the youngest too. Right? So we both have a who are you to tell me what to do attitude. <laughs> makes for fun. Makes for fun relationships. <laughs> and classic older child. Boom. I fist bump you, but I don't want. All right. So uh, can I tell you another story about when my Uncle Keith grew up? They, uh, he was a dairy farmer. What does it mean to be a dairy farmer? What, what did. Ah, they didn't make ice cream, but they did make the milk. They had cows. That made milk. Or like grow dairy things? They, they, well, dairy is from cows. 
It's the milk, right? So, but they grew corn to feed the cows. And there was, um, so there was a, a Sunday when uh, the corn was just perfect, ready to be picked. And my uncle talked with my grandpa, and they came up with this scheme to get my grandma out of the house because she was very strict about you don't work on Sundays to keep Sabbath holy, right, and to not, not to work on Sundays. And so they came, my uncle talked with my grandpa and to get her, take her out, go for a drive, spend the day, so that he could till the fields while she was gone, right? And my grandpa did it, and they came back, and my uncle hadn't done it. He went to the tractor and he sat there and he just, he just couldn't do it because he knew how disappointed his mom would be if he saw what, what they'd done. And my grandfather was like, what? Why? <laughs> but all of us in this room know what it's like to do the wrong thing when we're told to do something and we don't do it. And we also learn from that not to make the same mistake over and over again because of how badly we're going to feel or we don't want to disappoint somebody. When we, when we talk about sin, sin are things that we do that, that harm our relationship with God, right? And, um, and we all do it, sometimes knowingly, sometimes without knowing it. But when we do know it, we all learn, you know, gosh, I don't want to do anything that's going to disappoint God. I don't want to do anything that's going to disappoint myself when I'm trying to be my best. So Adam and Eve learned. You and I learned. We've all learned. And we're going to keep, and, but guess what? For your whole life, we, we learn. We make mistakes. God forgives us and walks with us through it and loves us no matter what. Make sense? Let's close our eyes, bow our heads, fold our hands. Gracious God, uh, for the mistakes we make, we're glad that we can come to you and know that you forgive us and that you love us. Uh, help us to learn from those mistakes and also help us to trust you when you say, uh, you probably don't want to do that. We, pr we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Continuing with the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, and he said to them, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So down in Kentucky, there has been a revival. Have you heard of it? The Asbury Revival, or they're calling it an outpouring. Can I, hands up if you've heard about it? Okay. A chapel service at Asbury University, uh, some kids stayed after, and then it, they didn't leave, and it turned into this incredible outpouring of, of the Holy Spirit. I want to read for you. They, they have officially 
ended it. And I want to read to you from, I had it all queued up and where is it? Okay. This is a Facebook post from Sarah Thomas Baldwin, who is the chaplain at Asbury University. Day 18. We are returning to ordinary life, which is just as full of God as the last 17 days, just a bit more quiet. I am sure we have a lifetime of journaling, prayer, and deep conversation ahead. Throughout the days as we passed each other in the halls and outside, we kept saying to each other, can you believe this? Is this really happening? As theologians and, well, everyone everywhere name and debate what it was and wasn't, what I do know for sure is that people are longing for God. I don't want to forget the Latino family, grandpa, dad, uncle, kids, mama, who when they made it into Hughes after what must have been a wait of hours didn't even go to their seats, they went immediately to the altar and collapsed in front of it. We saw this again and again. I want, I want to remember the family who drove 30 hours each way from Mexico for someone to pray over their baby for healing. My heart is broken with the 18 men who piled into a 15-person passenger van for nine hours to pray at an altar for even 30 minutes. Holding in my heart the time of prayer with an Indian pastor and his wife Diana from the United Kingdom interceding for their country and their campuses. Who can forget the Brazilians? They showed up. Their passionate prayers for their country, all the Brazilian flags, although graciously put away when asked, just too many people for all the flags. The story of a police officer who was so moved that he got in a family with two younger kids who had been fasting through the lines and waits out of his sheer compassion. As a mom of a daughter with special needs, the families who brought their children for prayer for medical issues just broke my heart. Their faith, their desperation, I feel it with them. I will continue to pray for Alina. Trying to communicate through an app with a couple in Portuguese, making a mental note next time we need to be prepared for interpreters. Then she wrote kidding, kidding about that next time. Remembering the pastor couple from Chile who sold their car to be here, and strangers passing on money. Can you give it to the lady who sold the car? Yes. I want to remember people giving what they had. We had no donation box set up as they handed it to us. Thank you, thank you, people said. This is what I have to give, whether it was a nickel or $100. So many high schoolers praying for relief from the bondage of pornography. Parents step in. Take away phones, keep them out of bedrooms. Your children are desperate. A joyful group from a church in San Diego, so full of joy of being here. Thank you for your encouragement. Praying with a team from Canada who were full of stories of God on the move in Canada and how God moved on their drive down. I want to remember the WhatsApp thread, 101 notifications at a time. Water needed in estes. Is there a prayer volunteer for out in the line? Porta parties overflowing. Ten people gave their hearts to Jesus here. The huge Jesus flag needs to come down. What's that ambulance for? It's 30 degrees out here. Heaters are on the way. The Salvation Army showed up. Thank you, Jesus. Mostly I will remember our relationships between one another on the ground team, the volunteer team, and the ministry team. Revival runs on the track of relationships. As one of our retired professors says, we were surprised, but not unprepared. We are a small community who loves Jesus deeply. We weren't ready, but yet we were. God is like that. I watched a little bit of the closing worship from their chapel, and a young student, I think who had been there from the beginning, stood up and said something like, this isn't the end. It's just the beginning of a life lived in faith. Last week, we had Peter, James, and John on the mountaintop for the transfiguration who would descend into the real world. They would find the disciples stymied with an inability to heal, and we have the most honest prayer in scripture 
by the father hoping to see his son healed, I believe, help my unbelief. Life is hard, faith or no faith. Or probably more honestly, faith sometimes is a blazing fire and other times it is a glowing ember. Our scripture passage today has Jesus in the wilderness. He was just baptized. This is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And the spirit calls him out into the wilderness. That's how his ministry starts, with a call out into the wilderness with no food, just the spirit. 40 days, 40 years. The number 40 is Bible language for a long time. We tend to jump to the temptations when we read the story, but let's breathe for a few moments thinking about those 40 days. 40 days with your thoughts and God. The Israelites would wander for 40 years to get Egypt and slavery out of their system to learn to rely on God for everything, including food. There would be mumbling, grumbling, arguing, and there would be resignation, and there would be faith. Forced to sit with yourself and your life for 40 days with God. There's only so much small talk you can have with God before it gets real. You have to be willing to face the truth about yourself and with God lovingly call you, calling you on your half-truths and your hypocrisies, in the end, it would be a gift, equipping you to enter back into the world that will call you away from God and yourself. Jesus is tempted. As a reminder, if he were not tempted, then it's not temptation. We are being told what are the things that he would always, not just then in the wilderness, but throughout his ministry, the things that would tempt him away from the path. To rely on oneself rather than God. To never have to suffer. And to seek glory in this world instead of working for the kingdom. These three temptations shadow the end, foreshadowing bookends for his life and his ministry. He would become the bread of life. He would suffer on the cross, and he would eschew the popular view of the Messiah, and he would be mocked as king of the Jews. But of his kingdom, there would be no end. But again, we see what tempts him. Again, if it didn't, it wouldn't be temptation. What tempts you to abandon your faith? It's a great question to sit with on your Lenten journey. How do you need to be saved from yourself? What are the lies that you have accepted as truth? How have the values of the world corrupted God's values to grow and thrive in you? Let us make space on this Lenten journey to ponder those questions. I was told on Wednesday that in the past, the last Sunday of February has been in years past an acknowledgement of Black History Month. I didn't know. My apologies. But easy to talk about temptation. We can talk about the mutual liberation we need to experience in this country and around the world around racial justice. We are all diminished and deprived when we don't live in relationship with one another. We need to show up for one another. Joan handed me this, uh, this piece of paper this morning and it's a, uh, some history. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but uh, it's, It's a lovely narrative about what if there were no black folk. This is a story of a little boy named Theo who woke up one morning and asked God, what if there were no black people in the world? 
Well, God thought about that for a moment and then said, son, follow me around today and let's just see what it would be like if there were no black people in the world. Get dressed and we will get started. Theo ran to his room to put on his clothes and shoes, but there were no shoes and his clothes were all wrinkled. He looked for the iron, but when he reached for the ironing board, it was no longer there. You see, Sarah Boone, a black woman, invented the ironing board, and Jan E. Matzelinger, a black man, invented the shoe lasting machine. Oh, well, God said, go and do your hair. Theo ran in his room to comb his hair, but the comb was not there. You see, Walter Sammons, a black man, invented the comb. Theo decided to just brush his hair, but the brush was gone. You see, Lydia O. Newman, a black female, invented the brush. Well, he was a sight. No shoes, wrinkled clothes, hair a mess without the hair care inv and inventions of Madam C.J. Walker. Well, you get the picture. And it goes through. Uh, Lloyd P. Ray invented the dustpan. Thomas W. Stewart invented the mop. George Salmon invented the clothes dryer. William Purvis invented the fountain pen. Lee Burgess invented the typewriting machine. W.A. Levette, the printing press. All black folks. Lawnmower, John Burr, Robert Spikes, the automatic gear shift, Joseph Gamel, the supercharged system for internal combustion engines, Garrett Morgan invented the traffic light, John Standard invented the refrigerator, Alive Parker invented the heating furnace, Frederick Jones invented the air conditioner, Albert R Robinson, the electric, uh, the electric trolley, Alexander Miles invented the elevator, Philip Downing, the letter drop mailbox, William Berry, the postmarking and canceling machine, Lewis Howard Latimer, the filament within the light bulb, Charles Drew, a black scientist found a way to preserve and store blood, which led to his starting the world's first blood bank. Dr. Daniel Hale Williams performed the first open heart surgery. So if you ever wonder, like Theo, where would you be without blacks? Well, it's pretty plain to see where we would, <laughs> we would be. We would still be in the dark. Um, I didn't know any of those names, not one. We are all diminished and deprived when we don't live in relationship with, an, with one another. The temptation is simply to worry about ourselves. Me, myself, and I. If you tuned into the Ash Wednesday service, you heard scripture, voices from scripture, demanding that we attend to the needs of all God's children. Now, one of the critiques, because you can't have a revival without people sitting on outside critiquing it, is that those kids, if you really want a revival, they should be out in the community, living out Matthew 25, feeding people who are hungry, clothing the naked, welcoming the stranger, not just singing and praying and worshiping God. I think the critics are, critics are being cynical, and I think it's a both and. You go to the mountaintop to go back into the world with your faith, and it will be hard, and you will be tested. But the sanctuary, the retreat, the camp, the prayer meeting is part of the faith journey. But if it's not lived out in the world, we have lost our way. I shared with you a couple weeks ago a prayer that was written by Howard Thurman. Howard Washington Thurman was an, an American author, philosopher, theologian, mystic, educator, and civil rights leader. He was African American. He wrote in probably his most famous book this, this quote from Jesus and the Disinherited. I do not ignore the theological and metaphysical interpretation of the Christian doctrine of salvation. But the underprivileged everywhere have long since abandoned any hope that this type of salvation deals with the crucial issues by which their days are turned into despair without consolation. The basic fact is that Christianity, as it was born in the mind of this Jewish teacher and thinker, appears as a technique of survival for the oppressed, that it became through the intervening years a religion of the powerful and the dominant, used sometimes as an instrument of oppression, must not tempt us into believing that it was thus in the mind and life of Jesus. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Wherever his spirit appears, the oppressed gather courage, for he announced the good news that fear, hypocrisy, and hatred, the three hounds of hell that track the trail of the disinherited need have no dominion over them. 
Howard Thurman was known for his acti activism that was fueled by his devotion. He was able to do what he did out in the world because he fed himself. He spent time with God. And he gave us this, he wrote this prayer for when we take time to sit with the Spirit. We read this prayer as the leadership uh, several weeks ago, and I shared it in one of the, one of the emails, but let me, I'm going to say it again. Open unto me light for my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. Open unto me hope for my despair. Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my, com for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me tenderness for my toughness. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. May you find time and, and I coach people, and I'm coaching myself as I say this, make the time to sit with the Spirit and face your truths. May we use this Lenten season as a time to rededicate ourselves to the path of faith that leads into the world with love and grace in our wake. In Jesus' name, amen.